Welcome to Breakthrough Barriers with Damali. I'm your host, Damali Peterman. On this podcast, we are delighted to introduce our new season's theme, Resilience. I, along with the guest co-host, will share how we remain resilient amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. We want to inspire our listeners to continue to break through. Welcome to the show. On today's episode, I am so excited to welcome Asahi Pompey, Head of Corporate Engagement, Goldman Sachs, and the President of the Goldman Sachs Foundation. Asahi, welcome to the show. Damali, it is so fantastic to be with you. Thank you so much. Oh, the pleasure is mine, and our listeners are in for a treat. Asahi is a member of the Management Committee and the Global Diversity Committee of Goldman Sachs. Asahi leads the Goldman Sachs Community Engagement Programs, 10,000 small businesses, 10,000 women, 1 million Black women, Goldman Sachs Gives, and Community Teamworks. Asahi serves on the Board of Managers for Swarthmore College. She joined Goldman Sachs in 2006 and was named Managing Director in 2010 and Partner in 2018. She also serves on the advisory boards for Forbes Next 1000, Glamour Women of the Year, and on the Advisory Council for the Milken Center for Advancing the American Dream. Wow, Asahi. I mean, I don't even know when you sleep. You are amazing, constantly giving back, inspiring others, and continue to to lift others as you rise. Well, you do the same. So we'll have to trade tips on uh, how we how we get some rest in the midst of it all. Oh, yes. Well, I'm really looking forward to our conversation today focused on the theme of resilience, especially as it relates to conflict and how you or your company and your industry navigated the past 20 months. The goal is to encourage and inspire our listeners to continue to break through. So we'll have our comfy, informal, free-flowing chat, and our listeners should feel as if they're eavesdropping on a private conversation between two friends. How does that sound, Asahi? Easy, because you're a terrific friend, so easy to do. The feeling is mutual, and I want people to know how I know you. So I was a participant in the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program, and I was always able to see Asahi in various settings because she's always been an inspiration to not only entrepreneurs, but to women, to students. I mean, the list goes on. And recently, I was able to meet her in person at the LaGuardia Community College, which is a of a school that partners with Goldman Sachs for a variety of different programs. Most of them we listed a few moments ago, um, but this was really special because it was the launch of the New York City version of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Fellows Program. And I'm delighted to mention that because our amazing podcast fellow, Jasmine Martinez, was, and I also met on that day. And it's this loving and wonderful connection between Goldman Sachs, between the foundation, between the community college, and also small business owners. And I love that it taps into many industries showing how collaborative efforts can really fuel our economy. We're so proud of the program and we're excited that you and Jasmine can be a part of it. It's, it's, it's an exciting new venture for us. It really is. And I'm learning from Jasmine and, I'm, and she's learning from me and also these experiences and being able to interact with just wonderful trailblazers like yourself and others, Asahi. And so I'd like to kind of turn the mic over to you for a moment. And I want to ask you, what do you want people to know about you? Describe yourself in six words. I love this question. Six words. So I would say, I'm sure I'm going to go over six words. So I would say probably I'm a cross between Amal Clooney and Nakia from Black Panther. <laughs> I love um, it. Definitely a little badass. I'm an ambassador. I'm definitely high energy. Um, if you're around me, you'll know that. I'm an undercover introvert. Um, most people don't know that. And I'm a fervent champion of others and sponsor of others. Oh, I love that. And I love just starting off with this combination between Amal Clooney and Nakia from Black Panther <laughs> that gives you like a perfect visual. <laughs> and, and I agree with everything that you said. You are all of those things and more. So how did you get here? I mean, tell us a little bit more about your industry. How did you sort of enter this field? Yeah, I'm probably the most unlikely Goldman Sachs partner you'll ever meet. 
I grew up, I'm an immigrant. So my family immigrated from uh, Guyana, South America when I was 10. All seven of us came to my aunt's one bedroom and went to New York City public schools. Goldman Sachs and community engagement was really nowhere on my radar, except maybe for organizations that engaged with us um, in that in that sense. I went to Japan for a year, lived with a Japanese family, studied Japanese, went to undergrad at Swarthmore, went to Columbia Law School, and really sort of made my way to Goldman 16 years ago. Um, like you, I'm a lawyer and really wanted to sort of, you know, see whether this storied investment bank with, um, with the legacy that it had would really be the kind of environment where I could bring my talents and grow and flourish. And I remember when I started at Goldman, I told my dad, either I'll like fail, fail spectacularly or I'll do really, really well. And I'm not sure which one it is, but I know I'll come out better and stronger on the back of it. And so it was with that sort of intention around really exploring and bringing my talents to Goldman that I came 16 years ago. And boy, it's been an incredible ride that now I'm heading all of our community engagement efforts around the globe. Um, and, but it was very, from unlike Unlikely, unlikely beginnings, really, Damali. It's exceptional. And I love hearing the story of you coming with your family from Guyana, being one of seven. And I don't know what that shakes out to be one of seven in terms of children or a mix of parents and children, but we have that in common. I'm the oldest of seven children. So at least we have seven in common. And I also studied in Japan and lived with the host family, Asahi. How do we not know this about each other? I love that I could always learn something about you every time we have an interaction. And I do believe that, you, you know, one, you are doing really, really well because you said you didn't know which one it was. Of course, you're doing exceptionally well. And you know, I mentioned this before, being head of community engagement, uh, you know, you're employing everything that you learn from your from your own experiences, also from Swarthmore to Columbia Law. But the programs that you lead, you know, small businesses, 10,000 small businesses, 10,000 women, 1 million black women, Goldman Sachs Gives and Community Teamworks. These are just some of the wonderful ways that people can see how devoted you are to the community, how devoted you are to not just all communities, but especially underserved communities that yeah. really do thrive with this uh, additional attention, investment, and commitment from you and from Goldman Sachs. And, you know, there's a lot of challenges that many of us have faced. And mm. so I'm curious to know, what was your single biggest challenge in sort of working in your industry throughout the pandemic? You know, the pandemic has brought like so much to our door. I think my biggest challenge during the pandemic was really boundaries and setting boundaries. I remember at some point early in the pandemic, a friend said to me, you know, the only days of the week are, you know, yesterday, today and tomorrow. Um, <laughs> because you just sort of lost track of all sorts of time. I was running the COVID fund, the largest fund ever in the history of Goldman Sachs. And then two months later, I was running the racial equity fund, our first ever racial equity fund. And from there, we were just engaging from our employees to our stakeholders, to the board of the firm, to um, our, our community nonprofits around the world. And frankly, we're still doing that because we're still in the midst of it. And so all of that was happening all at once. And so I think, you know, being able to set boundaries, I think, was probably the hardest part. And I think I was really bad at it at the very beginning. You know, I was sort of up at all hours, you know, of the night and day, taking calls in Asia and what was happening in India and really had lost track of, you know, morning and, and evening and night and having to sort of reset and say, okay, in order for you to deliver your best, you're going to have to go through. And I love the theme of this podcast, Amali Around Resilience, periods of rest and renewal. Um, and that's critical to bringing your best self into every single thing that you're doing. So yes, you're driven. Yes, you're intense. But everyone who is that way needs rest and renewal. And to be able to infuse that into, um, into my day and my activities was one of the biggest challenges, but also one of the greatest opportunities, which then allowed me to do even more. I love that. And I hope people are sort of taking that, that wonderful takeaway of rest and renewal helps you become more resilient. I, I, I love the alliteration of that idea and also recognizing that even for you and many others, that boundaries was something that, you know, we're constantly working on. 
especially as we're navigating new challenges and sort of figuring out, okay, what what, ban- what boundaries do we want to prioritize? How do we execute on and deliver on those while also staying true to ourselves? I mean, when you when I hear rest and renewal, that makes me think of self care, and that's something that we are all constantly navigating and trying to find that elusive balance between work and life. And I can also share that boundaries are something that I'm always working on that I hear everyone talking about um, because it's they're tested in different ways. And what's what's exceptional about you, Asahi, is that as you were navigating the pandemic, you were also helping other industries, other companies, you were managing the largest, you know, like you said, global equity fund. And we had a racial reckoning occur in the midst of a pandemic. And Absolutely. so, so your, I mean, your resilience, I think, was tested in many ways. And like that amazing Elton John song, you are still standing. So where does your resilience come from and how do you tap into it? You know, it, it's interesting because I think it's been an evolution. So certainly it comes from an amazing family, um, a mom and dad, and just sort of a, a you know whole network of educators in my family who really, you know, whose dreams for us were far greater than our dreams were for ourselves. And over time, um, I think our dreams grew bigger on the back of their aspirations for us. And so I think a lot of my resilience comes from, I don't carry things very long. You know, when something goes wrong, I think, you know, extract the lesson, but leave the pain. And otherwise, you know, if you're carrying all of that with you, it's your backpack, as I put it, your figurative backpack gets heavier and heavier. And, you know, it impedes how how quickly you can really navigate and pivot and move in the world. And so when something happens, you know, whatever challenge, I really am very self-disciplined around, okay, what's the lesson? Why is this challenge in your life? What is it here to teach you? And I really try to hone in on that. And then I leave the rest behind and I take the lesson with me. And I think that's the secret sauce to uh, to my resilience. Occasionally I'll chat with my sister and she'll say, remember when da 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 happened? And you know how wild that was? And my memory of it will be, you know, all around the lesson that I extracted rather than, you know, this happened and that happened. And she'll remember every single detail, which I love because then I'm like, oh, yes, you're right. Yeah, that was. Um, But I'm really about extracting the lesson and leaving the pain. That's the secret to my resilience. I love that. And that's a philosophy that I think others can adopt. I, it's funny, I subscribe to the same thing. And my sister always remembers all the details. And I'll say, well, I don't remember any of that, but what I do recall is that I don't want to repeat that or I want to take away that. And I think we have that in common. So I love it. I love you. Exactly. Totally. But we also need them to remind us because sometimes we're like, oh yeah, okay. You know, (laughs) like we don't want that to happen again, but extracting the lesson and leaving the pain is a great way to continue to forge ahead because it also recognizes that, you know, Things will occur, like there, things will arise, and we won't always be able to protect ourselves from, you know, things that life th- could throw at us. The pandemic, no one, no one saw that coming, and, and especially not to the extent that it occurred. And so, if you kind of carry that philosophy forward, and I love the visual analogy of your backpack, right? So, what you only have a finite amount of space, and so, what do you want to be? What do you want to put into your backpack? And being very intentional about it. And I, I also think that you know, it's part of the our DNA, part of our cold to leave the pain, but also there's something in it, like a part, or maybe it's sort of that, that fight, flight, or freeze, right? There's something in our brains that will kind of help us along the path as we continue to sort of see different things and recognize that, okay, I have my lessons, but also maybe there's something telling me not to go down that road. So I'm yes. go down this other road, right? So it's not like you completely have to abandon the pain, but I love that idea of, using that as a source of resilience and also reflecting on the fact that it comes from your family as well, because, you know, a lot of us tap into our resilience and it comes from many things from family, from faith, from learned experiences. And I think it's a great way to prepare people for a lot of things that could occur, but also we all make mistakes. And I'm curious to know if there were any mistakes that you made that you want to prevent others from making. I would say I didn't take as much risk early on in my career as I should have. I think taking more calculated risk 
would have been better for me over time. You know, I grew that muscle, but had I grown it earlier, I think it would have been better. Things will work out by and large, right? You've got, you've got your, your, your intellect, you've got your drive, you've got your hard work, you've got your community, you've got your village. And so I think, you know, very many of us are sort of held back by fear. And I think, you know, I love this new book, Fear Less, not Fear Less, but Fear Less. But that whole notion around risk taking and sort of leaning into it, like if not now, then when in terms of taking these risks? I think the story of how I got this job as head of corporate engagement, I've been at the firm 12 years and my boss, John Rogers, and the CEO, David Solomon, tapped me to become president of the foundation and global head of corporate engagement. And it always sounds like a great story, right? You were tapped by the CEO and, and the chairman of the firm to take on this role. Um, and it is fantastic. And their belief in me in, in being able to do this role from the job that I was in, co-head of uh, investment banking compliance, was a tremendous leap and judgment and risk-taking uh, in, in where, where very many people aren't willing to take risks on, uh, on people of color or their bar to take risks on them tends to be far, far higher. But on the other hand, it's not a great story in the sense that what if they hadn't, what if they hadn't tapped me, right? I loved my job, but I would still likely have been doing it. And so while it's a great story, it also says maybe seeking out those opportunities. I had people telling me over the years for a very long time, hey, you should be client facing. Hey, you should get really get out there. Like we see something in you that you could really be um, doing something even greater. And I'd be like, yeah, that's OK. But I really never took them up on it. But I think, you know, leaning into that more and sort of saying, pause, where am I now? What feedback am I getting? Is that a signal around a particular road I should go down or opportunity? And maybe I need to be more tuned to listening in to that and taking some action related to it. Because in hindsight, you can see a lot of the you know, gems and signals were there where people were saying to you, hey, Damali, you should launch this venture. More people would want to be your clients. You know, you've got something here um, and you decided to do that. Right. And so that's the thing I would say risk taking. I love that. And, you know, it's not a surprise that you said risk taking and you wish you'd taken more risks earlier. It's not a surprise because oftentimes lawyers uh, are risk averse, right? (laughs) And so that kind of goes along with the the profession. And I love you saying, if not now, then when? And I think the next part of that is, if not you, then who, right? And Mm -hmm. so just thinking of different ways to take and, you know, to be very clear, to repeat what you said, calculated risks, right? So just not just jumping off a bridge, but, you know, taking the calculated risk, doing the research and figuring out what you do, what to do next. Because I do think that a lot of good comes from calculated risks. And I've been in an auditorium or room where you were, Asahi, and heard the people sitting by me saying, she's incredible, isn't she? And so I know that it's the truth. Wherever you are planted, you bloom period. Like that's just a fact. And so what I love about seeing you, you know, I'm more sort of at the front facing for the world to sort of get to know you is that exactly what you said. You are an exceptional, strong black woman who's very successful, who leads and who also, as I mentioned before, helps others to rise your devotion to small businesses, your devotion to college students, your devotion to all the projects that you are involved with is something that comes from genuine and authentic love, passion. And I think also sort of just this, this, you can see the impact and you can feel the impact. And I think that is something that, you know, can't be taught that you're born with that. Well, you have it as well. And I think one of the things that I think, you know, we share in common is we're not driven by or feed off of being the exception. We want more people around the table, more flowers blooming. And we know that people have got it, as they say, you know, talent is everywhere, but all too often opportunity is not. And to create those opportunities for other people where they can find fertile soil to bloom, you know, and imagine doing that sort of across a multitude of people, the kind of different richness in society that we'd be creating. So that really drives me and energizes me. Oh, that's exceptional. And I think my word, my favorite word today is exceptional. Asahi. I feel like I've said exceptional like eight times today because I, every time I look at you, I just see exceptional. So I, I think that's like my word for this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Very kind of you. Right back at you. Thank you. And so 
I think the last question that I would put forward for you is, you know, something that my mom used to always say, which is each one teach one. And I'd love for you to suggest a book, a song, course, program, or something for our listeners to kind of carry them forward. 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. I know it's a controversial book, but it's a super interesting read. Um, so I would definitely recommend if you have it. And, and the stories are great and pithy. Song, And I Rise Up by Andrew Day. If I want to feel jazzed and ready to go, I just really, really love that song. Podcast, I'm a big walker. And so I've been listening a lot to Scott Galloway, Prophet G and Pivot. So those are the podcasts that I've been listening to, of course, um, in addition to Breakthrough with Damali. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much. And those are really great. We have a wonderful book recommendation, which will be available um, for you, the, for everyone to see and sort of the text that accompanies the podcast, a wonderful song, which that song, it just touches me. Like every time I hear it, it just sort of makes you think of any adversity you overcome and how you continue to rise. And then of course, um, podcasts, and I like hearing that you're a walker too, because that's something that is important to maintaining resilience. It's also that physical aspect of it. And so Asahi, wow, I, I just really appreciate you coming on to our show today. You are such an incredible, incredible role model for everyone, but especially for me and other small businesses as we sort of, you know, look to you for guidance and support and how you just make things possible. Just an example is even with the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Fellows Program, how you listen to the small businesses when we said we're having a hard time with talent retention and acquisition and putting together this op opportunity for us to connect with fellows and for fellows to have this sort of career path to to mentorship, et cetera. I mean, like that doesn't always happen and it doesn't always happen quickly. And it was something that I saw the immediate reaction and response to something that we were identifying as an issue. And it's been such an honor to be a part of this program under your leadership. Um, and so I just want to thank you for that. And thank you for joining our podcast today. Well, I'm a huge Damali Peterman uh, fangirl. I think, you know, you've broken through and you're helping others to break through as well. And so uh, keep doing what you're doing. I think it's absolutely phenomenal. Oh, thank you so much. So I'd love to thank you again and thank our audience for tuning in. I am your host, Damali Peterman, and this is Breakthrough Barriers with Damali. Continue to break through and have a wonderful day. Please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Breakthrough ADR. That's the at sign B-R-E-A-K-T-H-R-O-U-G-H, capital A, capital D, capital R. I'm your host, Damali Peterman, and this is Breakthrough Barriers with Damali. Although I am a lawyer, mediator, and an educator, and many of my co-hosts will represent various professions, we want to be clear that we are not providing legal advice, counseling, or suggestions. Our goal is to provide a roadmap for conflict resolution to generate future conflict resolvers. Continue to break through and have a wonderful day.